All right, then. Well, good morning or afternoon or evening, um, depending on part of the day you're going to be listening to this presentation and recording. Today, we're going to talk about probably one of the most common arrhythmias we see in the EP lab, and that is typical atrial flutter. And why is it an exciting topic to discuss? Because it's been studied quite a bit uh, over the years, and we really, at least we think, we really understand this arrhythmia, the mechanism, how it happens, and how to essentially almost cure it for our patients. Let's see, next slide. Oh, here we go. A little bit of anatomy review, and if you look at the left-sided picture on your screen, you can see this is a right atrium sort of cut across the tricuspid valve. The TCV abbreviation stands for tricuspid valve, and um, it really depicts our cavitracuspid isthmus because we talk about it a lot and it's important to know where it's at because this is the target for our ablation. And um, in the right atrium you can see this thick sort of a bundle on the left side, CT called crista terminalis, um, and you can see um, eustachian valve is abbreviation EV as well as IVC, that blue oval over there, um, and foramen ovale on the back on the interatrial septum. And this is actually demonstrates the path, how the atrial flutter happens, because what is mechanism of it? Essentially, this is the electricity gets trapped in a racetrack, and it keeps running around and around and around, um, lead into the clinical atrial flutter. How can it run uh, around the circuit in the heart? Because it ha the heart is made out of different tissues. Tricuspid valve, right there on the cut, it does not conduct electricity. So that means this is a barrier for the electricity to travel through. And eustachian valve, which protects IVC, does not conduct electricity either. So this is a barrier too. So when the electricity runs around the right atrium, it goes in between tricuspid valve and eustachian valve through those muscle in there. And um, it's able to have its own track. On the right side of this picture, you can see more of um, actual demonstration of the direction of the electrical flow. You can see the yellow error, so this is actual flutter circuit, but the electricity also travels through the blue arrows right there on the back of the right atrium. But those blue arrows, are, it, it means the conduction is very slow and it just has um, helps to maintain the flutter circuit. We also know that not every heart uh, can go into the atrial flutter. So why do some hearts do go into the flutter and how does it happen? Here's our again uh, the picture we saw on the previous slide with a little bit different mechanisms outlined. So if you look at the left picture on the screen, the star is a location of the sinus node, which is a typical driver for the heartbeat. And from that side, the electricity usually spreads to the rest of the heart, including right atrium, as outlined by the yellow arrows. So, but how does the flutter come to the picture? They, um, and it has something to do with the electrical properties of the cavitrocuspid isthmus, and that's a red arrow on the right-sided picture on the bottom. The way it's made, it's the isthmus is made of the muscle fibers, which are not really going in parallel. And the way it's made, the electricity travels through the isthmus slowly. That's why it's relatively easy to get electrical block in that area. A lot of physicians or researchers believe that atrial flutter to start will need a little burst of atrial fibrillation 
And you can see those five little columns on the right-sided picture. I illustrated that as potential um, firings from the pulmonary veins. Because if they fire so fast, it's going to get cavitor cuspid isthmus tired and eventually blocked. So electricity cannot pass the isthmus. There is no block because we didn't ablate it physically, but it's electrical block. So electricity cannot go through, but it can go in the, in the other direction. It can go up the septum, through the roof of the right atrium, down to crystal terminalis and come back. And by the time this electrical circuit comes back to the isthmus, it, it has already recovered from those initial bursts and it is ready for the electricity to go through. And it creates this is the, that racetrack uh, of the typical atrial flutter circuit, which keeps running around. And around this circuit, the electricity can run into, in two directions. The most common ones, it's counterclockwise. And there were some debates about uh, definitions of typical atrial flutter. Counterclockwise flutter is very common and in some literature that they call this flutter typical. But if you see that electricity move into the opposite direction, more of a clockwise fashion, this, uh, that type of flutter in some literature would be called a reverse typical. Can we tell on the EKG or ECG which kind of flutter we're dealing with? It doesn't really matter for us in terms of the uh, management or ablation, but it's um, kind of fun thing to recognize. Typically, we'll look on the EKG in lids V1 and uh, 2 and 3. If you look on V1, you can see that sawtooth appearance of those flutter waves is more upward. And um, if you look at lids two and three, the peaks of those sawtooth waves goes more downward. So this is a classic uh, picture of the counterclockwise flutter. And I usually memorize it by looking at just at V1 alone. If it's upright, it's counterclockwise. If it's downward, it's clockwise. And here is an example of that uh, reverse typical or clockwise flutter. If you look on V1 again, so those sawtooth flutter waves are pointing downwards and in lids two and three, they're more pointing upwards. So this is a, a classic picture of the clockwise atrial flutter. And you can, if you look at this previous picture, especially lid two and three, uh, it's very typical um, very reproducible pattern, as I mentioned, it's called sawtooth. And for us, um, a lot of times, even looking on telemetry when 12 leads are not available, a lot of times we can, in a way, tell whether we're dealing with typical flutter or not. When we are in the lab and patient comes in with uh, what we think could be typical actual flutter, we always have to confirm because there is a lot of possibilities in the EP world that your arrhythmia may not necessarily be what you think it is. And uh, one of the first things we do when we put catheters in the heart, I would go with my catheter on the cavitor cuspid isthmus and see. If you look at the bottom EGM on the right side of this picture, a lot of times we find mid-diastolic potential in there. If you see um, um, the bottom two lines are ablation catheter and above that there is CS catheter recording. So ablation catheter signal is right in between uh, the CS signal. So it, may, it makes us think that it, it most likely um, uh, is most dependent flutter. But we always have to confirm further. And a lot of times we would do entrainment as you can see on the top of GM on the picture. So what are we trying to do? We're trying to get into that racetrack circuit of the typical flutter and take control over it with pacing. And then um, that will help us to determine whether the side we're pacing from is in the circuit or not. <laughs> 
And um, you probably know the magic number, number of 30 milliseconds. So typically if you're in train, and remember to, to judge your result, you need to make sure your arrhythmia is stable. If your cycle length varies, it will be really hard to judge the result of the entrainment. Then you need to see what's your post pacing cycle length, like it's measured here, 255 milliseconds. And what does it compare to the arrhythmia cycle length? So if your difference is less than 30 milliseconds, classically you are in the side, which is a part of the circuit. If your post pacing cycle length minus uh, total arrhythmia cycle length is more than 30 milliseconds. Technically, you are outside the circuit and uh, you will have to look somewhere else. However, with flutter, although you, you got to be very careful because if you pace too fast, you, you will slow down conduction of that on that cavitrocuspid isthmus and um, um, your post pacing cycle length will be longer, not because you are outside the circuit, but just because you're pacing too fast and making conduction slower. That's why when we're doing tremit, we try to be a little, just a little bit faster than cycle length, maybe uh, usually 20 milliseconds faster to avoid that un unnecessary functional slowing down that could uh, impact our judgment. Um, that's why in Flutter world, if you do the entrainment and uh, you, you are outside the circuit because your difference in cycle length is more than 30 milliseconds, but this is the best you got. You go into the other parts of the right atrium and do entrainment and there is nothing better than, than what you got on the isthmus. And it looks that it, by the appearance on the EKG and on the EGMs that it looks like typical atrial flutter. It, we might still have typical atrial flutter because of that little functional block or functional delays we can get even if we go just a little bit faster than tachycardia cycle length. A tricky question is can you get post pacing cycle length that is shorter than tachycardia cycle length? And the answer is yes, you can. And because it usually it happens if we use a very high output and if we try to pace, let's say on the isthmus um, and 20 amps, we end up capturing a lot of tissue. And when we look at the return cycle, we actually see GMs which are not necessarily from the side where we're pacing from because the area that we captured was so large. Um, so something to keep in mind, if you see a short post-pacing interval, it's, um, it's, we would have to do something differently to uh, perform the study appropriately. And of course, ablation. Um, ablation for atrial flutter is offered very commonly. We have rather low threshold to offer this ablation. Because if we look at the guidelines for treatment of typical atrial flutter, ablation is strongly recommended because it offers a good balance of risks and benefits and um, with acute success of this procedure, 98 to 100%, which pretty much offers near cure from this arrhythmia. The idea behind ablation to, is to uh, interrupt the electrical flow across the cavitrocuspid isthmus. You can see this is little dots here on the isthmus. So the electricity can no longer go through that area. And here we go, you have tricuspid valve on one side, which does not conduct electricity. You have um, IVC on the other side, which does not conduct electricity either. And you have this area of ablation that will eventually become a scar, which will prevent electricity from running around in the circuit. In our EP world, if we do something to ablate or to take care of the arrhythmia, we need to have some sort of endpoint result or some, some way to test, did we do a good job or not? Um, it, in, in this case, do we have a block across the isthmus or not? So if you have no block across the isthmus, like on the left picture, you are, we typically pay CS to, to make this judgment. So your electricity will just travel from the pacing side um, 
to the top and around the roof of the right atrium, then down. And it will also go uh, in the opposite, ooh, in the opposite direction across the isthmus. And at some point, those two wave front, fronts will meet. If we have a block across the isthmus, right on the right sided picture, you, we still pay CS with that star, that's my pacing side, and electricity will go towards the isthmus, but it will not be able to pass our ablation line. And then it will go on top of the right atrium and again, come back all around and again, come back to the other side of the, uh, our ablation line. That's how it's supposed to look um, when isthmus is blocked. And this is the basis for the tests that we do to confirm whether we have block or not. I usually don't use the decapolar CS catheter, but I know my colleagues do. And if you look at this left um, sided picture on my screen, we are, we have decapolar catheter in place and we are pacing CS as uh, designated by the star. And the electrical wavefront travels to the isthmus and to the top of the right atrium. And at some point they meet. So if there is a block across the, across the isthmus, like right here, the black box, you will see that activation will go all around the decapolar catheter nice and smoothly in one direction and then meet right here. And you will see, if you look at the EGMs, you will see a picture sort of like D on the EGM representation. You see how it goes in from one direction and um, all the EGMs are organized. So what if you don't have a block? So you pace in CS, uh, electrical front goes upwards and then downwards through the isthmus and two wave fronts from the top and from the bottom meet elsewhere usually somewhere on the lateral wall of the right atrium. And what you see, you have some sort of chevron appearance. And this is what you can see on picture A. See there is two wave fronts kind of going through from two different directions and then they meet somewhere in the middle usually uh, right here. So it means that we don't have a block. There are some caveats with this, which will be um, goes beyond our discussion, but that's what you would typically see if, if you do develop block across the isthmus during the ablation. Differential atrial pacing. That, the basis for this maneuver goes to the point that if we are measuring the return cycle, let's see if I can, uh, the return cycle of, um, from the pacing, the, the way of the or path the, of, of the electricity will be the longest if we pace on one side of the line and measure on the other side of the line as close as we can. And if, but, but if we measure the return wave a little bit away from the line, the time from the pacing side to that spot will be shorter. Um, and this is, will be one of the maneuvers for us to, to make sure the block is present because if your time by moving away from the ablation uh, line does not get shorter or similar or remains similar to what you have by measuring next to the line, you don't have a block. So we have to do more work to, to, to get there. Also, during my ablation, I usually just have CS catheter and ablation catheter. And during the ablation, we can judge whether we got the block by measuring on ablation catheter, usually pacing spike to EGM uh, distance. And you can see that C or on this picture, CTI line where EGMs are depicted. Typically, um, we would have, if, if we have a baseline measurement, we would like to increase the timing by at least 50% to say we had a block. Well, a lot of times if you are in flutter, it's hard to judge, but when we break the flutter, I only have this distance to measure. Well, a lot of times we see how it jumps out during the ablation, we can say, oh, we probably had a block. Um, those who work with me, um, we measure double potentials a lot. And what are the double potentials? 
The double potentials are signals on both sides of the ablation line. So on one, if, like, if you look at this picture, if we have ablation catheter in the middle or on our ablation line, it can actually pick up signals on medial side of the line and on the lateral side of the line. And um, the wider the distance, the more likely you have a block. And if we look at the numbers, the research data would tell us that if we have distance between two double potentials of 110 milliseconds or longer, we pretty much um, have block. If we have it in 90 so 100, we still could have a block, especially if we have isoelectric line in between those double potentials. And they're helpful to determine the leaks in our ablation line, because if, let's say, if we're sitting with ablation catheter, like right here on the tricuspid valve side, and um, our double potentials are wide, but if we move towards the IVC, if there is a gap, we can see those uh, double potentials can get closer and sometimes become a one, one signal at the particular side of the leakage. So it can help us to find the gaps in our ablation line. So we, we can go there and um, target those sites for, for ablation. But it's, I think it's a very helpful tool for typical flat ablation. And also there are different parameters for them, but we can also measure them when we do a left atrial roof line. Um, that was my brief overview of actual flutter. And uh, for, the, for those of you who joined me live, thank you. And for those who are, will be listening to my presentation at the other time, again, thank you for, for your attention as well.